Okay, so we have four minutes before start time. We're just gonna let people trickle in this evening. Okay. Right, we're live on Facebook. All right, let me see. We have some folks in the room right now. Um, hey, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, I started this quite early, so we're going to wait about maybe four or five minutes before we get into it. Um, so last minute, if you need to go grab a beverage or do anything like that, please do so now. A lot of folks in here. That's funny, we have two Sandys in the room and they each spell their name differently. <laughs> Hello, Sandy and Sandy. Let's see here. Sandy's or, Sandy or Sandy? Sandy, like Greece. Okay. All right, we have about like four minutes. Check Facebook here, we should be all good. And for those of you that are already in the room, if this is, um, I guess I wanna get an idea of who here is really interested in dental sleep medicine, bringing it, this into your practice. If so, go ahead and raise your hand. There's a little function there where you could raise your hand in the room. Just trying to gauge here, cause <laughs> we're gonna go really in depth. One of the Sandys, there we go. Yeah, we're really gonna go in depth with this. Um, and I just want to make sure that we cover as much as possible for you guys. Um, and keep in mind that if you guys have any questions, there is a Q&A function here on Zoom. Um, and you can go ahead and type in your questions there. It doesn't matter when throughout the webinar, always type in a question. Then we get towards the end when we're wrapping up. I'm going to be reviewing those questions with Dr. Robertson. Um, and we'll get those answered for you guys. Perfect. All right, we got like three more minutes here. More folks in the room, awesome. And while we're waiting, if you guys wanna use the chat feature, let me know where you guys are joining us from. I'm here in South Florida where the humidity is quite nice. <laughs> um, and I know weather is probably real nice where you're at, Dr. Robertson. And Henderson, North Carolina. Yeah, a little, little humid. Humid. But it's pretty. Yeah. I live by the beach. It's like horrendous. You go outside, it's like poof, right in your face. The worst. Still have some folks joining us. Here we go. Oh, let's see. Angela. She made it. She made it. All right. So we're in about one minute and we are broadcasting this live on Facebook. So for those of you joining us on Facebook, welcome, welcome, welcome. There we go. Should be pretty good. And I hope I don't have a shy group tonight because I really want questions. If there's anything you have in your mind, any, you know, advice, anything like that, this is the evening to do it. Um, Dr. Robertson is not shy. He will give you pearls of wisdom if you ask for it. Uh, make sure you pick his brain. Okay, we have a nice full room here. Okay, there we go. The room's really filling up. All right. All right, so to get started on time, so I could uh, let you guys have your evening. Let me see, we are smack at eight o'clock Eastern Standard Time. So welcome everyone for joining us this evening. My name is Cindy Acevedo. I am the client care manager here at Sleep Group Solutions. Um, when they asked me to do Sleep TV and to get an idea of what I kind of wanted the topic to be, I thought what better than to bring one of our clients that does dental sleep medicine to kind of share 
what got him started with this, to share the things he sees in his own dental practice, and just basically share his experience. And if there's any questions any of you have, you know, from dental peer to dental peer, please use tonight to type it in in the um, chat box. There is a question feature here in Zoom. Please feel free throughout this tonight's webinar to ask your questions so that I can go ahead and relay those to Dr. Robertson later. Um, and then with that being said, um, out of the clients that I have, I work with multiple clients. I deal with phone calls all the time, asking for advice and things like that in regards to case presentation, screening, and et cetera. So thinking of who I wanted to join us this evening, I immediately thought of Dr. Deuce Robertson, who is incredibly smart. And the reason why I asked him to be here tonight is because of his passion for this. If there is anybody out there that's super passionate about sleep, it is Dr. Deuce Robertson. Um, so Dr. Robertson, I'm going to go ahead and just introduce you to the room. If you just want to share a little bit about yourself, um, and then we'll go ahead and get started. Sure. I'm Deuce Robertson. Uh, I practice uh, general dentistry in Henderson, North Carolina. I have for the last 23 years. Um, married, I have four sons, um, one left in the house. Uh, the other three are out of the house. Um, and uh, started practicing uh, dental sleep medicine probably in 2015-ish uh, area. Um, I'm currently president of the North Carolina Academy of General Dentistry. Um, I'm a diplomat with the American Board of Dental Sleep Medicine, um, deputy regent with the International College of Dentists, um, and uh, just here to help. I'm very passionate about sleep. I'm a, a patient myself, so uh, I know how this feels. So. That's what got me started in this. Nice. So, so hello, just everybody. Get, yeah. <laughs> and just to get started, just so we can delve deep, and we're going to have this more of this. I mean, I'm going to be asking you questions and so forth, but this is more of a conversation. I know you quite well, but I wanted the room to get an idea of what it's like for someone else getting involved into sleep. So sure. um, you mentioned that you were passionate, which is why I brought you on here to share your story with everyone. But passion starts from somewhere, right? So I wanted to go into how you first got involved with dental sleep medicine. Like when did it start or, you know, what sparked you to go and learn about it? And I just kind of want to walk through um, basically how you got started in DSM. Sure. Uh, probably 2011, I was <clears throat> 12 years into my practice. Um, I started having anxiety. Uh, I didn't know where it came from. I went to the doctor and of course they um, said I had generalized anxiety disorder. Nothing had changed in my life. Um, maybe a little bit of weight on me, but nothing else had changed. Um, they were quick to put me on medication and I was quick to believe that that's what I needed. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't until I think 2015 that I did a sleep group solution course with Rebecca Leahy uh, in Charlotte. And boy, were my eyes opened. Um, I was one of the guinea pigs who uh, took the home sleep test. Uh, and I think I won the prize for having the worst apnea. My heart rate uh, while I was sleeping was uh, 120. Wow. Um, I was in fight or flight all night and releasing cortisol and epinephrine and all kinds of good stuff that when you wake up, guess what you have? You have anxiety. Um, and so that, that sort of started me on this road going, wait a minute, there's, there's a whole lot of things here that people don't understand about systemic diseases that we come across in the dental office. Um, a lot of physicians are quick to prescribe medication to treat them, but not quick to find out the root cause of these diseases. I was dead set on finding out the reasons uh, I was feeling the way I was feeling. Um, the funny thing was, as several folks do, and I think um, a lot of folks who do a, a sleep group solutions course, um, they look at the echo vision, which is pharyngometry and rhinometry. We'll talk about that later and go, gosh, you know, I don't, that's a, that's a bill or a note that I really don't want right now. Surely I can do this without having to buy that technology. So I was one of those. I left Rebecca's course um, thinking that I didn't need it, that I could do this on my own. 
And I made myself uh, an oral device. Uh, it was actually a, a, can I list names of devices? Oh, absolutely, yeah, we're, we're very frank, transparent. Yep. Um, I had a TAP, uh, TAP3 uh, Elite maybe uh, device that I made myself, which kind of locks me in the anterior region. And I used a George Gage. A lot of folks out there know what a George Gage is. And uh, I wore it for, for probably a year. Um, I didn't get any better. I had a lot of transient uh, TMJ pain. Um, and I knew something wasn't, wasn't right. Um, so I found a dentist friend who actually you guys, John, uh, interviewed on here a couple of weeks ago, uh, Dr. Jennifer Bell. Um, who was really, really knowledgeable. Um, but I called her up and I said, you know, I'm not, I don't feel right. Um, let me come to the office and get on the pharyngometer and let's see where we are. So she said, make sure you bring your device. I did, uh, I got on the pharyngometer and found out that I had actually, using the George gauge, pulled my jaw out too far. Um, most folks do it at 60 to 70% max protrusive. Um, which where I was uh, with my tap three, but it was actually making my apnea worse. Um, using the pharyngometer, we, um, we checked with my device in, measuring the airway space, moving it back, um, using airway metrics after that. And it turned out that my sweet spot for therapeutic position opening my airway was eight millimeters end to end. We made a new device. Um, I did a Panthera DSAD, which is a surgical nylon device, very, very comfortable. Um, waited a few weeks. I think we waited six weeks before I did a post-op sleep test to let some inflammation mm -hmm. die down. And my AHI dropped down to a one and I was sold. Um, that's not even talking about the subjective symptoms that I was not having. I wasn't falling asleep driving anymore. That's read, important. It's important. I, I could read more than three pages of a book um, without falling asleep. Um, and uh, so I immediately called Rebecca Leahy up and said, okay, let's do this thing. And so I think that was in uh, 2017 when I purchased the, the older equipment, the, the first version of the Ferragometer. Um, and so I've been doing it ever since. And um, yeah, I, I just, you know, I wouldn't practice without it. Um, but that's kind of how I got started. And then I'm able, when I'm sitting with patients and I'm talking to them, unlike things in dentistry that I haven't had, I don't have an implant. I actually don't have a crown in my mouth. With sleep apnea, I can, I can talk to them and I can commiserate with them. I know how they feel. Um, and, you know, I can see it in their eyes. You know, I had a patient today um, I think my assistant's on here with us and she can, she can concur with this, but, um, you know, these patients are miserable and they don't understand why, you know, this patient thought that everything was because she was old and driven by gastric reflux, had no idea the the physician was, um, quick to prescribe medication for reflux and that was it. Mm -hmm. And take it as you need it when you have reflux. Well, guess what? She only has reflux when she sleeps. That's interesting. Not when she eats during the day, only when she sleeps. Why is that? So it was neat to open her eyes on to uh, why these things are happening. Um, and I, I just love that with, with my patients. Um, plus, it, it doesn't, I had neck surgery back in 2019. Um, I can practice dental sleep medicine and it doesn't hurt my back, doesn't hurt my neck. Um, and I'm saving people's lives. A lot of people think that uh, it's just snoring and, and it's so much more yeah. than that. Um, so that was a long answer to your question, but that's how I got started. And for those of you joining us this evening, um, Dr. Uh, Robertson threw out a lot of terminology and I just want to touch base on it so everyone understands. Um, he threw out his AHI number that posts once he got a corrected bite position with his oral appliance and he got sleep tested, that his AHI went down to um, a one. Um, AHI is the um, apnea hypopnea index. It's the index that basically shows us how severe one's apnea is. So for those of you on here that are not familiar with that, 
in order, mild sleep apnea, and I hate the terminology mild sleep apnea, you either have it or you don't. But the mild range, um, an HI has to be between um, five and 15, moderate is 15 and 30, and anything above 30 is considered severe. And what that means is you have, in order to be considered an event, your event has to last at least 10 seconds or more. So if someone had, let's say, severe sleep apnea and their number was a 32 AHI, that means 32 times per hour, they have events where they're suffocating and their airway is closing every hour. And each of those events last a minimum of 10 seconds or more. I've seen on sleep studies, as I'm sure you have, Dr. Robertson, like some really crazy sleep studies. I think the worst one I've ever seen, someone stopped breathing for, I think, two minutes and 12 seconds. So, I mean, this isn't like something elective just for snoring and so forth. And sure, with treatment and can help from snoring, um, but this is to get patients to breathe safely in their sleep, which is really crazy. He mentioned his heart rate. What did you say, 120 on your initial sleep test? Yep. Folks, your heart rate should not be beating 120 beats per minute while you're sleeping. It's that's that's a lot of stress on the heart. So that's where you see a lot of folks with, you know heart disease, if your heart is continuously working nonstop, I mean, that's going to cause some wear and tear in some diseases, such as there's been nocturnal heart attacks, strokes, um, daytime fatigue. He mentioned he was happy he wasn't sleepy while driving. I'm happy for the sake of him, but for the public around him that he's not driving sleepy, it's dangerous sure. stuff. So yeah, absolutely right. This isn't just about snoring. This is about saving lives by treating the core root I mean, they were so quick to tell you that you had what some type of anxiety disorder and just throw out a medicine for that instead of finding out what was causing that. Um, so by treating sleep apnea and treating airway issues, you can actually help eliminate, eliminate a lot of health problems that our patients are suffering. So sure. Thank you and, and for that. Yeah, go ahead. Sure. That, you know, that patient today, I mean, you know, I, we're, we're doing a home sleep test, right? And so I think she's going to be quite surprised at the results of it. I can already tell, you know, once you see this, you can't unsee it. I say that all the time. And so this patient is definitely going to have some problems. Um, but she said, it was an interesting question. She said, you know, how do people know that they have sleep apnea? We, we don't know. Yeah. And so I started going through all the things. Do you fall asleep driving? Um, do you fall asleep in the movie? All the th things that are on the Epworth sleepiness scale before we even started to do that. Um, I'm going, these are signs and symptoms that aren't okay, that are dangerous and um, that people need to be aware of. And so mm -hmm. we're trying to educate, you know, when, when Jennifer Bell and John were talking uh, a couple of weeks ago, it was, it was truly about every patient needs to be screened for sleep apnea. Yeah. Um, the ADA says that North Carolina Dental Society says that um, I say it every single patient that comes in needs to be screened for sleep apnea because it's such a deadly problem that people just don't uh, they're not aware of. So. Well, let's go to our next little topic here. Um, and for those of you, I know we mentioned people being untired and so forth. Um, keep in mind, high blood pressure morning headaches, um, large neck circumference. Um, if anybody's interested in um, getting um, like a list of symptoms that you can start screening in your own office. Yeah, I love that, that poster. Right there. That was my favorite thing to ever create is the signs and symptoms poster. Sometimes just having Perfect. something visual in your office gets patients to look at it while they're waiting and go, oh, and have they had no idea that that correlated mm -hmm. to that. So yeah, those are, look at the signs and symptoms and you'll really, you'll start seeing it everywhere. That's everywhere, good. everywhere. I mean, you, you look at the, uh, you know, I might want to wait till your next question. I don't know. Um, but when you, when you look in somebody's mouth and you see a scallop tongue, why is there, why is their tongue scalloped? Oh, it's always been that way. Well, there's no, there, you, this is a perfect segue into my, I was going to ask you because okay, I don't work in a dental practice. I work with yeah. dentists all the time. I love my clients. I visit them all the time. I'm about to visit one of my clients in St. Louis um, on Thursday. Um, but you and your team see patients on a day-to-day -day basis. You guys are in their mouths. You guys see these symptoms. So I want from your feedback, what are things you and your team see in your patients that you know are correlated with sleep that 
you can share that maybe other folks here don't realize that that has anything to do with airway issues? Sure. Well, um, clinically, uh, the first thing that you see is scallop tongue. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a major um, risk factor for sleep apnea. The reason they have scallop tongue is when they're sleeping, their body is responding, trying to breathe. And one way they, that your, their, your body does that is it stimulates the hypoglossal nerve to move the tongue forward out of the way of the airway. When mm -hmm. you do that, you're pulling all the soft tissue forward. So when you're sleeping and you do that, your tongue then presses against the teeth. So you have the scalloping on the sides of the tongue. Um, that's, that's one of the first things. Obviously, if, if they're large tonsils, um, any inflammation in the back, venous pooling around the eyes. You see that a lot with kids. Um, vaulted palate, uh, tongue tie. A lot of times, so I'm going to go on a ta tangent here with kids. Oh, no, share this. I need people to understand. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, normally when a, when a child is developing, um, their tongue rests at the top or the, 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 the palate part of the mouth, right? So you don't think that it's such a, a strong muscle to, to move bone, but over time it does. And what it does is it, is it flattens the palate out, mm -hmm. um, which is also the floor of the sinus. So kids who are tongue tied, uh, meaning that their muscle attachment of the tongue is closer to the teeth, they can't really lift that tongue up to go against the palate. And so, the maxilla, the upper jaw develops in a way that's vaulted. And so it, again, if the, the palate is like this, that means the floor of the sinus is like this as well, which impinges then on nasal breathing. Um, and these kids then develop obviously a constricted maxilla closing the airway. They can't breathe out of their uh, nose. Um, these are the kids that you see that are normally class two, that are laid back, they're sleeping with their mouth open, um, they're snoring, kids should not snore. These are things that you can do interceptively at a young age to prevent um, this child from getting worse. Um, clip the tongue tie, uh, possibly refer to an orthodontist who's on the same page as you, because there are some that aren't. Um, to either start expanding that palate. Um, sometimes all it takes is a, is a tongue tie clip um, where that tongue, it depends on the age, can go up there and start moving things out of the way. Um, but what you see then are adults in that same situation who have sleep apnea, they don't know it, but they have the vaulted palate, they have a constricted maxilla, they have a tongue tie, and they didn't know why they're snoring at night and are tired all the time. So, you know, those are things that I see clinically. Um, but I also look at the medical history because if the patient has high blood pressure, atrial fibrillation, um, diabetes, um, depression, anxiety, these are red flags that say, okay, there's, there might be something going on here. Um, if there's acid erosion that you see um, from reflux, or if you, even if you don't see it, but they're on medication for GERD. Um, again, these are all things that would make you go, hey, how are you sleeping? Um, are you tired? Just to ask those questions. Now, I, I put those on my medical history um, every time the patient comes in anyway. I, I want them to... Um, you know, to be thinking about that before I even walk in the room. Um, but, uh, you know, it's the information is there in front of you. And again, when you start learning what to look for, you, you almost go, oh, my gosh, it's everywhere. This is <clears throat> this is a bad problem uh, in our population. You know, society is getting more obese, um, developing more fat kind of like my double chin here, more fat around the neck um, that helps to collapse the airway. Um, these lead to uh, further problems with sleep apnea. Um, 
so yeah, I mean, you, you see it every day. Angela, again, my assistant, I think is on this as well. She is. And uh, my hygienist. And, and, um, so you've all got to be a team um, to be able to recognize this. Absolutely. Um, speaking of patients, I mean, I, I've, I've had different webinars over the last, you know, seven and a half years. I've been with sleep group of, you know, I love hearing patient stories. You know, I have clients that'll shoot me a text to share something of this is the feedback I got from this patient. You know, some of it just like brings you to tears. Like it's really, really um, awesome. But I know that with your practice, and I just had a quick question. So I recently came to your office, um, yeah. see your new practice, which is beautiful, by the way. I love the new office. Um, and I saw that you had the coffee maker in the um, waiting room. Did you have that set up at your older um, office, like a coffee maker in the waiting room? I did. I had it actually in the corner of, the, I had a much larger reception area and I had it kind of tucked in into the corner. Um, I always ask that because I know a lot of dental practices that I visited have some type of Keurig situation going on in the area. I mean, to me, that's almost like a freebie way for you to get an idea of, I mean, if you have a patient coming in at two o'clock and they go straight for the coffee or they come in with a coffee drink or so forth, like why are we needing that type of energy you know, that's already right. that late into the day. So that's a huge telltale sign. Um, but yeah, I, I implore anyone here that has a little coffee maker in your waiting room, please go ahead and just start taking a peek or have front desk to see who's actually going for it. But I was hoping if, if they were over the course of time of you doing dental sleep medicine, if there were any, you know, if there's a patient or two that's been in your mind that you've helped um, without sharing, obviously the patient's name and sure. information, but kind of to share that story of their response of being treated or, you know, what kind of feedback you have gotten from patients that you've treated for sleep? Well, well, first of all, um, the responses from the patients are all so positive, period, because they feel so much better. And, you do, and people who don't have apnea don't really understand the difference that you feel when you don't, when you're not tired all the time. When you can concentrate, when you're not confused or falling asleep, and and all that stuff. So, um, yeah, I've got a I've got a few. I think um, I'll talk about a couple if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, probably one that's that's been a great, um, uh, I guess, walking uh, advertisement for me. Um, she was she was a Medicare patient. We ended up doing having to do a uh, a Herbst um, uh, appliance. Um, and folks who who want to know what that is, it's <clears throat> it's actually an orthodontic appliance. A Herbst is something that they use in, in ortho um, with telescoping arms. Um, and the she just she felt so much better, and so. If, if you follow me on Facebook, anything that I post, she's going to be the first one that says, this is awesome. And she was one of my first patients and she's still feeling great. What was, what was a great success for her was she suffered from pretty high blood pressure. And after about two months of treatment, uh, after we, we gave her the device, she went back to her physician and she was able to get off the blood, for, blood pressure medication which was a huge win. Um, another one that we had, um, this patient had an AHI of 61. So keep in mind, and yeah, I don't like mild, um, moderate or severe either. I like stage one, stage two and stage three because people listen to that a whole lot more. Um, you know, it, 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 yes, it does make you think of cancer um, which is not what we're trying for, but I want people to understand that if they have mild apnea, you have apnea. It's stage one apnea. You may only have an AHI of six or seven, but your oxygen may be decreasing a whole lot more than if you had moderate or stage two. So you have to look at that as well. So when you have an oxygen, oxygen depletion like that, it's affecting the whole body, all of your organs and everything. So, but this patient had a, an AHI of 61. He had AFib. 
he was being seen um, by a pulmonologist. Um, I won't say where, but uh, he had failed CPAP. They had him on a BiPAP. Um, if folks aren't familiar with BiPAP, it kind of helps breathing in and helps breathing out. Um, and he was sort of failing that as well. They could not get his oxygen below 9% below 90, better than 9% below 90. And so he said, he told them that, you know, my dentist doing these oral devices and I'd like to try that. And of course they said, there's no way that your dentist can help you with an oral device. It's not going to work. This was one of these hold my beer situations, right? And so I ended up making an appliance and we got him immediately without any titrations down from 61 to 25. So that's still right on the cusp of a stage three. I think it used to be a 25 with starting stage three. I, that's kind of how I like to do that. Um, uh, sleep apnea patient. So even though that was a great success, um, I wanted better. So when we did the um, home sleep test, I noticed the majority of his apneas were uh, while he was supine or on his back when he was sleeping. Mm -hmm. So we gave him a sleep order to slumber bump. If people aren't familiar with that, it's something that you wear on your back that keeps you when you're sleeping from rolling over your back. It's actually very, very comfortable. But we did that and we retested him with the device in the slumber bump. Got his AHI down to a seven and his oxygen was 0.7 um, below 90. And so that letter that I was able to write to the pulmonologist was, there were so many things I wanted to write, <laughs> right? Mm. But I held my tongue and I kept it professional. Um, but uh, they actually took him off of the BiPAP and put him full time on my uh, oral device. So that was certainly a win. There are a lot of people that go, oh, he's severe apnea. You can't help him. He's severe. You can't, it has to do CPAP. My biggest successes that you can see are people who have a high AHI because you're able to see that jump in, um, I guess, really repair of the airway. Um, I did have another one. Not everybody that I see who has apnea, you treat. Yeah. So this, this fella came in, Angela would agree with me. He was, he only came in because his wife brought him in. So there are which a lot of, those, a lot. Yeah. which happens a lot. And so those are, those are tough men to deal with because they don't think they have apnea. They don't want anything, no matter what you do, it's not going to work. Right. Yeah. Subjectively. So he didn't believe that he had sleep apnea. He was actually being seen by a neurologist for tremors. Um, he was on the cusp of Parkinson's. Um, that's a whole nother story with sleep apnea and, and Parkinson's and getting stage three uh, sleep. We won't go into that tonight, but um, anyway, we tested him and he was extremely severe. And he had never tried a CPAP. So we got him uh, back to his physician to get on a CPAP. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, his tremors stopped. Angela, I don't even know if you knew that. Um, but uh, so that was a huge success. And it wasn't anything I did other than recognizing the problem and getting him to the appropriate place. So. That's a, that's a good lesson for folks is that you don't have to treat everybody. Um, not everybody needs an oral appliance. Some people need other, other ways to, to help them, CPAP, um, surgery, or, or whatnot. Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, I did have one that was, a, that was, that was great. Um, this was a physician that came to me, she, she had an existing oral appliance that a, a professor at a university who, who teaches um, uh, about sleep apnea um, to other dentists had made her that was not working. And so we treaded lightly, but we 
got her on the pharyngometer, changed her position, made her a new appliance. And you talk about one happy lady. Um, you know, treating those physicians is always a nice thing to oh, uh, yeah. for your practice. Um, but, you know, you have those cases all the time. And I, I did have a case that <laughs> this is a funny case. Um, one of my first ones that I did, I did everything right, right? Kind of like endo, you do everything right, and then something doesn't work with the root canal, and you go, what did I do wrong? You didn't do anything wrong. Sometimes it just doesn't work, right? But this patient came in after uh, six weeks mm -hmm. of an oral device, and I did a, uh, uh, did a home sleep test, and the results came back, and she was <clears throat> much worse than when we started. And for a whole day, I just kicked myself going, what did I do? I've made her, I've made her worse. I've made her worse. And I couldn't wrap my head around all this. This is one of the reasons I actually stopped doing endo. It was very, very frustrating for me. I did everything right and the tooth still failed, right? But it was a colleague that I reached out to who said, were they sick? And I said, you know, I, I don't know. I just, they came in and I, I didn't ask those questions. I just initialized the home sleep test and gave it to her. And sure enough, that patient had been in the hospital with fluid on her lungs the whole weekend. <laughs> and I didn't know. Why didn't I know? Because I didn't ask her specific questions when I gave her the home sleep test. Talk about a lesson learned. Wow. Um, so I'm, I'm really hard on people now when I do that. Do you have any sinus issues, any allergies, anything going on right now that would impair your, your good night's sleep tonight? No, okay, let's do this. Yes, let's wait a few days and, and call me when you're feeling a little bit better and let's do it that night. Um, so anyway, I feel like I'm talking too much about those, but yeah, no, those- No, no, this is, no, yeah. this is great. I, I want people to get an idea of what it looks like, what type of feedback. You were mentioning about CPAP and keep in mind, um, I know that with dental sleep medicine, the treatment that our clients, the dentists offer is that of the oral appliance, but in no means do we ever talk bad about CPAP. CPAP works when people use it. And the problem that we come across with patients is a lot of patients are not necessarily compliant with CPAP, meaning they're not using it every night or for the whole duration of the night. Um, I know recently, not that long ago, there was a huge CPAP recall um, that hindered a lot of patients out there that they did not have their CPAP. I mean, you're in North Carolina, Dr. Robertson, I'm here in South Florida, and I'm automatically thinking of all of my clients in the Gulf region and along the Atlantic coast, because we're in hurricane season right now. Um, in order for your CPAP to work, you need electricity. Um, and if your electricity goes out, which those of us in this region are well familiar with, um, it's good to have some form of therapy. So I know a lot of um, patients out there use their CPAP, love it and use it, but then they have their oral appliance as a backup or for when they travel. If you go through airport TSA security and you have your CPAP with you, you have to take it out in a separate bin like you would your laptop and so forth. So I know a lot of folks out there like to travel with their oral appliance just for the sake of convenience. So there's like a little mix of everything. I'm going I'm to interrupt you. I'm going to tell you a quick story here. So yeah. my, my wife and I were on a plane. We were going to uh, Scottsdale where you're going in a few mm -hmm. in this weekend for yep. the uh, ASBA. Yep. Um, and we were going, I was going to do uh, Rouse's airway prosthodontics course up there. So we were on a, a plane heading to a course on sleep apnea and on the same aisle uh, against the window was a, I, I say a young lady, she was younger than me, but she was cocked back like this, mouth open and snoring. And she ended up uh, stopping breathing, mm -hmm. just, just like apnea, but they couldn't wake her up. They couldn't get her to take that next breath. And of course, everybody on the plane started, you know, panicking. Um, I get up, we had um, a pulmonologist on the plane, which was fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, but it turns out she had sleep apnea and she did not have an oral device. 
and she wasn't wearing her CPAP on the plane. Oh, yeah. And so that's something that people don't think about. You go on a long plane ride, um, you better wear that thing if you're planning on falling asleep. Not only are you going to disrupt all the passengers, but it's but it's dangerous just because it's not nighttime and and you're not like sleeping or going to bed. Um, you know, sudden death can occur anytime with this. Um, it was just ironic that that happened on the way to a you know to a sleep course. Um, just you know shows how important this is. Wow. Didn't mean to interrupt. I just. Oh, that no, 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 that's crazy. I never even thought about that, about one having an appliance for if you fall asleep on the yeah. um, plane. And mm-hmm. I mean, not everyone's going to have a pulmonologist or any type of medical help on a plane. So that's... Oh, actually- by the way, the pulmonologist didn't want to listen to me on the plane. So <laughs> that was another one. I'm like, come oh, on. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. Anyway. Um, I wanted to touch base on... Um, so. I know that you're a diplomat with the American Board of Dental Sleep Medicine, Mm -hmm. um, but we all started from somewhere. So there's a lot of things that you know now, that you've experienced now, the do's and don'ts, um, learn from mistakes and so forth, that I was hoping that you could share any bit of advice, pearls of wisdom regarding to oral appliance therapy, screening, um, Mm -hmm. HST, anything like that, that you wish someone could have shared with you back when you first started, like anything that you think, Hey, this might come up. FYI, pay attention. Anything you want to share with that? Sure. Okay. Well, um, first of all, I think you need to get, you know, if you're going to do this, you need to get a good continuing education. You don't need to get it in one place. I started with sleep group solutions and I think that's a fantastic place to start because they have a, a great protocol to, to, get this going in your office. Um, People like me um, will speak um, and help other dentists learn the ins and outs of sleep apnea. Now in saying that, I I do think you need to get CE other places. Now I did uh, SPEAR. Um, I started with the AADSM. Um, I felt it important early on to have my diplomat. And so it took me about three years to get my diplomat um, with the, uh, at at that point when I was doing it, it was a three-part mastery series with the AADSM. The education there was fantastic. Um, That yes, there were things that I didn't agree with. Um, As you can tell, I'm kind of vocal and I'm kind of passionate about things. And so I argued with a couple of the, uh, the folks teaching and, and, you know, in a, in a kind way and whatnot, but, um, you know, for, for learning, you've got to branch out and, and do a lot of different seeds. You'll learn things from each different places. Um, in my town, so, well, you know, in my state, um, we have been a little bit behind with, um, accepting, uh, home sleep test as a screening tool. It's something that myself and another colleague of mine, Tracy Johnson, worked on diligently for several years to try to open the doors um, for dentists and and untie the hands of dentists. And I I think we finally have accomplished that. Um, Early on, that would have helped me a lot because in, in my town, I'm in a small town, small rural town. And if you tell a patient that we have one sleep physician, He's at the hospital and you got to go spend the night at that hot hospital um, and spend, I don't even know what the going rate is now for um, an uh, overnight PSG, 2,500 to 3,000. A couple thousand thousand dollars. That's not going to happen here. They're not going to do it. And these patients fall through uh, the system. They fall through the cracks and they're the ones that you read about in the papers that died peacefully in their sleep. And it frustrated me to no end for years, which is why I fought so hard um, to help rewrite the resolution for the state, meet with the state board, because if we had something in our armamentarium that can allow us to jump on these patients and help and fix them and save their life quickly and early, then there's absolutely no reason why we shouldn't be able to. So you ask about things if I, if I had those things earlier. HST, 
I wanted earlier. Um, you can tell I'm passionate and, and it, it gets me discouraged that I had to fight on it because, you know, you can do all kinds of things in dentistry that are invasive, um, that can harm a patient. A home sleep test doesn't do that. It doesn't harm a patient. It's non-invasive, but it can, it can save a life and it can save a life quickly. Um, the other thing that um, I, I wish I had done earlier um, was I wish I had gotten pharyngometry earlier. Trying to do this with a George gauge, yes, it works. But it's like a, it's like, um, a clock being right twice a day. Every now and then, the position you put that patient in with a George gauge is going to be the right position. But more than likely, you're going to have to have multiple appointments to titrate that device to get it to the therapeutic position. Multiple appointments in a dental practice is not economical. You're going to lose money. The patient is going to begin to lose faith in you because they're going, wait a minute, maybe he doesn't know what he's doing because he can't get this thing right. You're going to have most likely symptoms of TMJ until you get this thing right. You're going to have a patient who doesn't feel just right. With a pharyngometer, rarely, rarely do I have to titrate from my therapeutic position. And that saves time, that saves money, and the patient is feeling better quicker. So I wish I had done the pharyngometry earlier. Now, I know it was only two years different between when I didn't do it and when I had it. Um, I wouldn't practice without it. This patient today that we screened, I, I just, I, I love it because I'm looking at the results of the pharyngometer and, and in my head, I've already designed her oral appliance because I know where her collapse is. Um, and it's just, I don't know. Um, that's something by far. Um, home sleep tests, uh, pharyngometry. Um, I'm trying to think what else I wish I had uh, early on other than the education. The education is a double-edged sword. I've done a lot of continuing education. I did the mastery, I became a diplomat. And I, I feel like there's so much left to learn. Oh, absolutely. There's always Ignorance. no hat on education. There's not, ignorance is bliss. When I first started, I thought I knew it all, right? <laughs> you know? But and that is not true. Um, and I know that there is still, uh, there are still so many things to learn. I just spent, uh, a day in uh, a sleep practice in Myrtle Beach, Jeff Horwitz, mm -hmm. who is uh, one of my mentors. He's, he's so smart with this stuff. He incorporates, um, I'm sure he won't mind me talking about his practice, but it's, he's got an operatory for sleep. He's got an operatory for TMJ. He's got an operatory for ortho because all three are so tightly related. Yeah to this, to sleep-related breathing disorders. Um, and he's able to treat all together, all encompassing. And so for me, I'm going, gosh, I still have so much, so much to learn. Mm -hmm. I wish I could spend, you know, weeks at his practice just following him around. Um, so never, never stop, never stop learning. Um, you know, when you think you've got enough, you don't. Um, uh, anyway. Something you mentioned, I was curious about, um, and I'd love, even if, it doesn't have to be exact, but if you could throw out a number, as someone who tried doing sleep um, without the echo vision, which is, that's where we're going to go into next, versus then having it, what, how many appointments would you say you were able to shave off, and like, so without using it, um, what were the average amount of appointments you were needing for a patient versus now? All of them. <laughs> um, it's such a, that's a hard question because without it, everything's arbitrary. Yeah. It's arbitrary. You're, you're, you know, with a George gauge, you've got a, you've got a two millimeter and a five millimeter. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know if you remember me talking at the beginning, 
you know, I did mine with a George Gage, right? Uh, my first one. When we found out my therapeutic position, what was my vertical? My vertical was an eight. Yeah. You are never going to find that with a George Gage. You can have titration appointments, bringing that jaw out and back and out and back for years, and you'll never find the therapeutic position because you have to increase the vertical. Yeah. Um, so that's a hard question. Um, again, you're right sometimes, but most of the time you are not. And you're in your head, you're going, I don't know what to do here. Yeah. Because you don't know what to do there. You don't know, well, where is it supposed to be? I don't know where the airway opens other than retesting them over and over and over. Let me tweak it this way and let me retest you. Let me tweak it this way and let me re oh, it's not getting better. Let me go back. Yeah. Um, there's no doubt that therapeutic position is, is the key for pharyngometry. Now, in saying that, a lot of times I don't make an appliance at therapeutic position. Mm -hmm. I'll back it up a little bit. So if they are an eight millimeter vertical and a three millimeter protrusive, right? The further out that you take that mandible, the more likely you may have some transient TMJ issues that may be tough for the patient. Yeah. I'll work myself, I'll work the way, I'll work the patient out that way. Okay, so if you start at an eight or end to end or even an eight one, um, then over time you can bring that patient out another millimeter just to see if they get any better. They may be fine at the eight one. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Does that, does that, that answer sense. your question? Okay. That makes sense. Um, and you kind of already touched base with that. I was going to ask you because I know I asked you to come on here because, you know, I handle client care and sleep group, meaning my department that I work with is just our clients. So those are mm -hmm. actively doing sleep in the office, they're utilizing the Echo Vision. So you being a client, you also use the Echo Vision pharyngometer rhinometer. You kind of already touched base with that. I was going to ask you to share um, how it's worked for your practice and why you use it, but I, you pretty much covered that spot on of how it helps. I know that with the, something I wanted to mention, um, a lot of folks out there, at least in my opinion, that I've seen over the course of the years, a lot of people are visual people. You could explain something to someone um, and, you know, it's like, mm, okay, but once you see it in front of you, you know, and you, you, can, you could attest to this, like using the pharyngometry and having a patient see what their airway looks like breathing normally, and then seeing how it plummets and how it actually collapses kind of really helps with case presentation when they can physically see it. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a huge patient motivating tool. Yeah. Um, posters are as well, but when they, when they see this and you, you have to explain it to them because it is a little bit confusing at first for patients. But when you explain it to them and they see it, they're going, wow. Like today, the, the patient we had had an open airway. The, the mean, I think, was 3.9. Was it that high? I can't remember. Um, collapsed. She collapsed almost 80%. So the difference in the graft, whew, you know, with the collapse was phenomenal. Even the patient was like, wow. I mean, it was almost like a, you know, almost mm -hmm. like a straight line. And um, those are things for, for patients that really help them um, decide to go through with treatment. Yeah, so it's a, it's a great tool. The HST is, as well, that was actually one of our points that we used with the North Carolina Dental Society and State Board, that <clears throat> sometimes it's hard to get patients to go for treatment that is actually needed being able to see um, uh, a sleep study mm -hmm. um, the, and, and being explained a sleep study because most of these patients, if they've had one before, they were never, it was never explained to them what they're looking at, right? So when you explain that to them, it's a great, uh, um, it's a great tool for them to go, yeah, this, I got yeah. a problem. Look at, my, look at my heart rate here. Look what it did here or I'm an oxygen really dropped down. Um, look how loud I was snoring. You know, those kinds of things yeah. make a big, big, big difference. Um, you know, an argument was put to me a couple of years ago that 
well, you know, it's it's the same thing if we do a, we tell a patient they need a crown and they don't do it. And I said, no, I'm sorry. The, the patient's not going to die from not doing a crown. Yeah. They're going to die from not having sleep apnea treatment. Your life will be shortened. It's not a win. It's, an, it's not an if, it's a win. Um, uh, if you have untreated sleep apnea. So. Absolutely. And I know that you mentioned, I think another thing that helps, and you kind of touched base with this earlier, and it leads to my next section, which you've already, so I know you've been tested for OSA, you were an oral appliance, so you can speak to patients from experience. Yeah. So anybody in the room, anybody on Facebook, if hearing all these, this conversation we're having here and hearing all the signs and symptoms, and if this is something you want to start bringing into the practice, I can't, it, I can't even stress enough how important it is to test within the practice, like testing right. yourself, testing your team, because it's one thing, and you mentioned this earlier on, earlier this evening, how when you're able to talk from experience, I mean, you, it really comes across genuine and you, you, you right. share their concerns, you share their struggles, you know what it's like. So it's a lot easier to speak with patients in that sense. It is. And, and so it's not just the feeling of having sleep apnea. It's, I know what it's like to wear an appliance. Yeah. I know what you're going to feel. You know, there are mornings that you wake up and go, you know, jaw hurts a little bit. And to realize, you know, this is, this may be a transient thing. Mm -hmm. um, so you can, you can ease the patient's mind saying it's okay. Um, let's give it a couple of days. If it doesn't go away, we may back you up just to have to see what happens. If we back you up a little bit, you feel better then we might back you. We might make you go forward a little bit. So yeah, these, these are things, and I, I would encourage anybody that's out there, even if you don't have sleep apnea, you need to try these devices and wear them. You need to know what it feels like so you can talk to these patients about these devices. Um, I've worn several different devices. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry? I've worn two. I think the first one yeah. I was placed in was on accident. It was a dorsal fin appliance. Yeah. Um, there's really not a lot of lateral mobility, but I brux as if it's my second job. So I grind a lot and I almost broke one of those fins off. Um, so let's see. Uh, okay. actually, so let's see, where's the, camera? Oh, that one's the one. Is that the one you're wearing? No. So, yeah, so I used to wear this. This is a, not mine. This is a demo. This is a Panther, Panthera D sad. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's not a dorsal, right. But it does have a little wing coming up right here. Yeah. So I believe it or not, I've broken two of those. Oh wow. Not the bands, but the wing, because I clench and, and I have crazy dreams. And um, so a dorsal is not good for me. And you wouldn't know that unless you wore these things. So I encourage people to wear them. The, the next one I'm doing is a um somnum somnamed somnamed avant, um, which gives me great motion. Yeah. Uh, free motion. Um for my like jaw. That. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's a, that's a big thing. And I, you know, with the mastery, uh, stuff that we did, I don't know if they're still doing it, but one of the requirements was to make devices for yourself and wear them and report on them. Um, which obviously I was already in several devices and, and yeah. so it was easy for me. Um, but these things being able to talk to the patients, I mean, if you don't know how it feels, how are you going to talk to them? Mm -hmm. I'm going to say, yeah, I understand. I know what it feels like on your cheek or, you know, if you're wearing a tap. Yeah, I get it. I know you can't open it. It won't let you open any or a dorsal fin, you know, get your cheek caught between the two fins. Um, yeah. So there, there are all kinds of things, but I would encourage people to, uh, to try that. Awesome. Well, we're gearing towards the end here. So I'm going to start peeking into, because I see some comments here in the question. So, um, Folks, if you have a question, go ahead and put it here in the q and I'm going to start peeking through here. Um, so this isn't necessarily a question. This was a comment from earlier this evening. It said, not my patient, but my husband had a severe heart attack and his cardiologist had said it was because he has sleep apnea. Yep. So hope your husband is okay. That, that is a lot. A lot of people don't understand the correlation between that. That's why, like Dr. Robertson said, we really do implore you to you know, seek out CEs, education, if you go to um, www.sleepgs.com, you'll be able to see our calendar of courses. We have them published all the way through December of 2023. So if there's one that you see that you like, 
go in there, take a look at it. Um, there is a contact form that you could ask questions. Um, and then we'll be sending everyone CE later on this week. Um, so if there's any questions, you can always reply to the email. We're here to help you out. Um, if you have any questions, Dr. Robertson can help you out. But um, start with some CE courses and take a peek on there. But um, that's really, really important here. Um, let's see here. Oh, Angela had made a comment earlier. So I'm Dr. Robertson's assistant. Angela, we learned today that just because you don't fall asleep while driving or sitting in traffic doesn't mean you don't have a problem. We had a patient that never kept driving to that point. She would stop and sleep. But if she kept driving, she said she would doze off. This, this, is, this is an interesting thing. The, the Epworth sleepiness scale, when you get into it, is a very important uh, scale for insurance and, and for screening purposes. But as with most uh, screening tools, they're not 100%. So you can have a patient say, hey, do you fall asleep when driving? You know, no, I don't at all. Okay, but you, you're really tired. You look really tired. Are you sure? No. Okay, well, do you get, do you get tired when you're driving? Yeah, if I'm getting ready to fall asleep, I'll pull over and take a nap. I'm going, okay, all right, that's what I meant. So they answer the questions. I had one, you know, do you fall asleep in a movie? Never. I'm going, really? Even if, you know, it's dark? He said, no. I said, okay. He said, I don't go to movies. I said, okay. You, so and I'm glad you asked those extra questions. because Right, you really, you really have to dig uh, on a lot of these patients um, because they're, they're answering them at face value and you have to go, wait a minute, okay, you don't, you don't go to a movie. I get that. Um, do you fall asleep when you read a book? No, never. Okay. Even when you start, you know, it's not a, I don't read books. Okay. <laughs> All right. But if you did, you know, there, there are, uh, so you have to really learn to, especially if you know, because you'll, you'll know these patients, you can see them, you know, they've got problems. You really got to dig a little bit deeper to, to find the, the answers that you truly want. Let me see. I have another question here. Can you please explain the link between hypoglossal muscle and scallop? The scallop, the scallop tongue? I would assume so, yeah. Okay. You know, as far as when you, when you have apnea and you're asleep, your body responds. I'll, I'll even go into the uh, uh, Inspire um, thing Ooh, as well, because yeah. that's a, that's a kind of good, Anyway, so when you fall asleep and you're going to sleep, you have apnea, your body does all kinds of things to try to make you breathe and open the airway. Your diaphragm will start flexing, you'll, you'll grit your teeth. One thing that happens is you have a stimulus where your tongue will then try to push forward to move out of the airway. When that happens, it pushes against the lingual surface of the, usually the lower teeth. Um, and that forms indentations, which are called scalloping. And when you're looking for those in the mouth, don't have the patient stick their tongue out because when they stick their tongue out, it elongates the tongue and you can't, can't see it. Just a regular and you'll see the scallops, okay? That is, in, in my opinion, one of the number one indications. Inspire, you've seen the commercials on, on Inspire. It's like a pacemaker, it's an implanted, um, device that stimulates the hypoglossal nerve to activate when you're in an apneic situation to move that tongue forward um, while you're sleeping. I hope yeah. that answers the question. Yeah. That should help. It says, um, do you require CBCT on your sleep patients? No, not at all. CTP, it, it's a great thing, but it's a static image. Um, that's where I think pharyngometry trumps CBCT um, because I can see what's going on in the airway real time. Um, CBCT uh, is a, I, I guess, a static image is probably the best. Uh, would you agree with yeah. what I'm saying here? Yeah. Um, now there is uh, somebody out there that is, is trying to connect the two, um, pharyngometry and CBCT at the same time. Um, which would be a fantastic tool to have in a practice. Um, but no, that, that is, no. Now, um, like Jeff Horwitz, yeah, he uses it really to diagnose what's going on with the um, TMJ joint. 
um, during this. Okay. Um, I have a question here. What's your favorite home sleep test? Uh, is it a one-time use? And, and a question, if you're open to share, is what do you charge patients for it? Okay. Um, what's my favorite sleep test? There's, there's, there's a whole bunch out there. There's a ring. What's that? I said there's a ton out there. Ton of them. Um, there's Aries. Um, there's the ring. There's the watch pat. Um, I kind of like the watch pat. It's a peripheral arterial tonometry. Um, it gets you all the information you need. You wear it on your wrist. Um, you've got a pulse ox. Basically, it's a high resolution pulse ox to fit on your finger. Um, and it's got one lead that you'll fit under your shirt that puts right here for your heart. Um, it's non-invasive and you can sleep very, very nicely. The Aries is a unit that fits on your head. It's got a cannula that comes down and leads on your head. Um, now all these, uh, the ring just actually fits on your finger. I'm not crazy about that one because you don't get all the information that you need specifically in my opinion, uh, sleep position. That's so important. Just like that patient I was telling you about earlier. Um, so the watch pad is really my, my go-to. Oh, and, and as far as fee, when I do an initial screening, I do not file it under medical insurance um, because they are not diagnosed with sleep apnea. Um, I will usually anywhere from 200 to 250 um, cash um, for that. I, I don't know whether I can say that or not. And if I can't yeah, say Yeah, I mean, keep in mind, so with all of my- that, But, um, you know, that's a, uh, that doesn't hurt the patient um, financially to do that. And you can start saving lives. Especially in comparison, we were talking about the PSG studies, that could be a lot, but I know that uh, nationwide, my, I have clients everywhere, um, the average fee of what people have been doing is anywhere between 250 and 350. It really depends on your demographic. You know your patients yeah. to go from there. Um, I see a, a question, are dentists in New Jersey allowed to test patients in the office? So I know in New Jersey, kind of similar to that of North Carolina, in terms of dispensing a home sleep test device for diagnostic in New Jersey, no, but you can test and screen for obstructive sleep apnea. Everybody could screen for that, but I have lots of clients in New Jersey that do so. Just to, just to reiterate, that's mm -hmm. a little bit different now in North Carolina, that, that the uh, North Carolina Dental Society, um, we, we, we just actually uh, did a friendly amendment at the House of Delegates this May um, to mirror what the ADA passed um, this past November, which states that if you have a patient with high risk for sleep apnea or sleep-related breathing disorders, a dentist may dispense or prescribe a sleep test. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, to me, that's a huge win um, for the state of North Carolina. We still need to get the state board um, on board with that, which I think will, will, will happen. But um, New Jersey, I know New Jersey, what, what was the other state, Georgia? Was it Georgia, Georgia, New Jersey, yeah. And uh, so, you know, in the whole United States, you know, you don't want to be the last one, last man standing in something mm -hmm. like this preventing people from. Uh, um, I see a comment here from, and I love this person. She's like one of the biggest personalities I've ever met. I loved her energy. If I could bottle her energy and sell it, it would sell out. Uh, Lisa Gushin, which I know is a good friend of her, she said, you guys are the bomb, along with other little comments she was putting here that was cracking me up throughout the um, session. I, I have no doubt. Yeah, um, yeah, and I see another fun one from someone named Nicola Ken. What type of bourbon heals sleep apnea? <laughs> these are like <laughs> cracking me up. I know these are friends of yours. I was like, because they obviously know you, but. That'd be Woodford Double Oaked. This is the best. And I think that's all we have here. Um, it's literally like four minutes past our time here, but uh, Dr. Robertson, you know I love you. Thank you so much for sharing sure. this. I think it really helps a lot coming from someone who's been doing this, someone who started this, learned about it, decided to try it on their own. Like you kind of covered what it's like for all the different folks out there that are doing sleep. So I really do appreciate your time this evening. Sure. And, and anybody can reach out to me. Um, you can reach out to Cindy and get my email. I'll tell you right now, it's tarheeldentistry at yahoo.com. If you have any questions, anything, reach out to me and I'll be happy to, to answer and, and help you out.
So yeah. Um, and Ruth, I see your question here about um, information on the Echo Vision and the cost. Um, if you'd like, I could have one of our folks reach out to you. I have your email information from your registration, so I'll make sure that we send that out to you. But yeah, I'd love to get this out in as many folks as office as possible, get you guys as clients. Sandy, thank you so much. She said, thank you both. Very informative. Sure. Um, that makes me happy. I mean, if the least that can happen is you guys to start screening and actually seeing things differently, it'll go a long way. Ruth mentioned great presentation. So um, thank you, Ruth. Um, so yeah, thank you guys for joining us tonight. Um, Dr. Robertson, again, thank you so much. Please give my love to Allison for um, having you come out here and do this. I know this is pretty late and stuff like that, but guys, thank you so much. We'll send out CEs. Visit sleepgs.com. Take a look at our courses. We would love to have you there. Um, yes, there will be a recording. Um, like I said, I am traveling literally tomorrow to go see a client and I'm going to a dental conference. As soon as I get back, I'll go ahead and generate a recording for a link, but this has been um, advertised on Facebook. So you could always go to Sleep Group Solutions in our page and it's going to be there um, for you to uh, view as many times as you need or you wanna share it with someone. So thank you so much. Um, I think we are good right now. So um, yeah, I've answered all the questions here. This is good. You guys were very, um, I love all the questions here. This is really good. Not everybody was mute and quiet, which is good. So Dr. Robson, you were doing something good. So that's awesome. Yeah. And, and Angela, thank you for being in the room. Love seeing you in here. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, so we're all good. Thank you guys. Have a good night. And thank you again, Dr. Robertson. You're welcome. Thank you. Good night. Bye-bye.